Welcome everyone. I'm here today with Li Jingjing, who I'm very lucky to be interviewing for a second time. Jingjing is a well-known Chinese journalist. As part of her work, she travels throughout China and has spent time in Tibet, in Xinjiang, and other autonomous regions. So I thought it would be helpful to get some insight from her in regard to the situation with China's ethnic minorities. Since the Western media contains such consistently negative coverage regarding the treatment of ethnic and religious minorities in Xinjiang, Tibet, Inner Mongolia and elsewhere, it will be interesting to hear a bit of detail from someone who spent significant time in those places. Li Jingjing, Happy New Year, a bit late, and thank you very much for being here thank with us today. You. Thank you for having me again. I'm very lucky, very honored to join this conversation with you again. Like you said, I'm a journalist based in China and I travel through China, uh, especially some regions that were some Western countries, some Western politicians very interested in, like Tibet and Xinjiang. And I, like I have interactions, I had conversations with people living there, people of all ethnic groups. And they, what they tell me is, and what I saw, and what the life here are completely different from people reading from like some Western media. And I believe some Western politicians or some Western journalists who they are either never been to those regions or they went to those regions, but they were seeing those regions with a lens of prejudice. And there are a lot of information just out there, for example, the laws, how the laws are protecting different ethnic groups, so much information just out there, but maybe it's in Chinese. So people in the West, uh, the, because of the language barrier, they don't know or maybe some people just don't even bother to read those information. So I'm very honored that I'm probably gonna share with you some useful information that you're interested, you want to know more about. That's great, thank you very much. So to start with, are you able to tell us something about China's constitution and the provisions that it makes specifically for ethnic minorities? For example, how are languages and traditional cultures protected by law? Like there are so many laws in China that put protecting uh, languages of different ethnic groups and cultures in a very important place. Um, I can name like at least three or four, as far as I know. There are there are probably more, but uh, because I'm not like a law expert, I probably couldn't name all. But like to to give you a few, the most important one, Constitution. Um, the Article Four of Constitution says. Uh, this uh, regional autonom autonomy is one of the basic component of China's policy, political system. In terms of the protected language, I think I'm gonna, because I just opened the page, web page of constitution, I can read a few pages of how important they listed to protect the languages of different ethnic groups. Like article four of constitution, it says all ethnic groups has have the freedom to use and develop their languages. And uh, they can use their languages in their daily life, in work, in communication, and all the languages should be respected, protected by law. That's just uh, Article 4 of Constitution. And uh, there's uh, because this uh, regional autonomy is a basic component of China's like, political system, and uh, we have uh, a law specifically on regional ethnic autonomy. Uh, for example, like the Article 21st, it says even though all the government officials working in those autonomous regions, the during to perform their duties, they have they can and should use their the regional languages, use one or multiple, several different languages, because even though a, a, one region is, for example, Xinjiang, the Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region. But Uyghur is not the only ethnic groups living here. Um, to be honest, in Xinjiang, like China has 56 different ethnic groups. In Xinjiang, they have all 56 ethnic groups. They all live in Xinjiang. So apparently there are way more languages than Uyghur languages. But because Uyghur language is um, like used by the majority because Uyghurs is the, like, they are the ma majority of the minorities. So in this region, Uyghur is the like regional language. So in those regions, people can use national language Mandarin, they can use Uyghur languages. And if they went to some areas that are mainly inhabited by other ethnic groups, they can also use the other languages. 
So basically, it requires all the government officials to use the language. And actually, it encouraged everyone, not just like normal citizens, both those working for the government institutions in autonomous regions to learn each other's language. If you're a Han, they encourage you to learn the minority groups' languages. And if you're from minority groups, um, you need to learn Mandarin, of course, which is the national language, and also learn the language of other ethnic minorities. So they encourage to learn each other's languages. And for government officials working autonomous region, if this government official are capable of speaking more than two languages, they will get some bonus or some prize, something. So it's something like, <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> you are doing a great job um, in like uh, protecting or boosting the solidarity of different ethnic groups. So they will get some bonus. And of course, um, all the schools, there were also education, law of education, that in autonomous regions, schools have to teach in at least two languages. Mandarin, of course, that's the national language, but also um, they can teach um, like the, uh, the language used in this autonomous region. Um, I, have, I went to one middle school in Tibet um, and I would just want to take a look what, what they teach in the school. So apparently they have, they have like Chinese class, of course. They also have a Tibetan class. I have a video of that. I published it on my Twitter. I can share it with you if you need to use for our interview. So they have Tibetan language class and they're basically they're teaching the literature of Tibetan, how to write poems in Tibetan. And they also have English classes. So it's mandatory. It's, it's mandatory in middle in those schools, in school, not just middle schools, high schools as well, like to teach um, like at least two languages. Um, I also saw some students learning how to input Tibetan into computers. So they have different computers that can type Tibetan. So that's happening, and it's the same here. Uh, Right now, I'm in Wurumuchi during for a business trip, and just here, uh, for those who are saying Uyghur languages languages is being wiped out, that's just completely lie. They go everywhere, all the roads. They have so many signs that are written in uh, probably three languages: uh, Uyghur language on the top, in the middle is the Mandarin, and the bottom probably uh, English. And here's another thing, in autonomous region, um, the language of this region has to be above the national language, Mandarin. Um, that like here is the same. If you see like multi-language language, the sign, the Uyghur language is above Mandarin. And also went to uh, Guangxi, Zhuang autonomous region. Zhuang autonomous region because Zhuang ethnic group is the majority in that region. So Zhuang language, is uh, one also the uh, regional language, and the drone language has to be above Mandarin everywhere in public signs in posters. So that's how are they respecting the languages and the cultures of different ethnic groups, and also uh, there are so many culture has been like regarded as national intangible heritage, and also a lot of them have been enlisted into the UN. UNESCO intangible cultural heritage. So that basically shows how much they're respecting and protecting the culture and the languages. Yeah, that's very interesting and very different to the narrative of cultural genocide, which has started to be <laughs> a lot in Western media. Um, you know, what, what we hear in the media here is that the Uyghur language is being wiped out, Tibetan is being wiped out, that children in school are being forced to learn only in Mandarin and, and are being punished for using the, the minority languages. So it's it's great to hear um, to hear that narrative countered so effectively. I was in Xinjiang just over a year ago. You you notice immediately that there is people wearing traditional um, Uyghur Muslim dress, and if you go into a, a cafe or a restaurant then you know, they would have the traditional food of the area and they certainly wouldn't have pork and they wouldn't have alcohol and things like this. Um, but it was just 
a completely different experience to what I might have expected if I trusted the, the media and the Western presentation of it. Yeah, those who are creating those narratives, they probably just never been to Xinjiang because no matter how many articles, how many reports you read from the Western media, as long as you step your foot in Xinjiang, you go to the street, you talk to people, you will immediately realize that's what they are saying is wrong. Languages are everywhere. All Uyghurs speak to each other in Uyghur. Of course, they also speak Mandarin. When I'm Han Chinese, I cannot speak Uyghur. So when I talk to a Uyghur, we have to communicate in like, uh, like Mandarin. But when they speak to each other, they use Uyghur, just like us. We communicate in English because that's the common language we both, we both speak. So that's just like a common sense. So yeah, I, I think a lot of people believe those narratives, but a lot of people are soon realize it's wrong as long as they arrived in Xinjiang, just like you. So can you say something about how life for minority has, has changed since the founding of the PRC in 1949? Did the Chinese revolution cause any significant changes in the lives of minority peoples and the relationship between those minorities and the state? First, like 1949, the founding of China not just changed minorities' life, it changed everybody's life living in China. Like, regardless of whether you're Han or, or Uyghur or Tibetan, doesn't matter. It's changed um, this land from colonizers, foreign aggressors, so it changed everyone's life, it changed my family's life as well. Like my, my, my grandparents used to live Northeast, they, like they were uneducated, they were farmers, they were poor. But uh, to me, like, this, like the third generation, so I got the chance to get, um, to get like full education, study abroad, working in big cities like in Beijing. So like, it's a big change to my family. So that's just like a big change to normal citizen, normal Chinese living here. But uh, okay, uh, in terms of minorities, for example, I can share with you some experience I had in Tibet. Last September, I traveled to Tibet and many people don't know that Tibet used to be this feudal serfdom society. For example, those people who ran away from Tibet like, uh, in the 1960s, they used to be the, um, like the nobles, they call them themselves nobles and were religious privileged groups. Uh, they are the like, higher classes in Tibet. They only accounted for 5% of the population but they own 95% of all the wealth in Tibet back then. So most of people were just serfs back then. And even, like, even the serfs were classified into three classes. So even among the serfs, there were three levels. And the third level, of course, was the worst. They were considered, they were not even considered as human. They lived with livestock. They were considered as animals. So we met one like descendant of a surf, a surf family. So this guy is working as a tour guide in one of the uh, like huge villa that one of the noble families in Tibet lived. This noble family, um, they had, a, I think he told me he, they, this family had 5,000 serfs in the 1950s. Just one family had 5,000 serfs across Tibet. And his parents used to be uh, one of the serfs for this family. In, back then, serfs, you will always be serfs. It doesn't matter how much education you got, how, man, how much money you got. First, like if you are a serf, you won't get much education, you won't get money. But it's just even marrying a noble fam member, you, it won't change your life. You were just doomed forever serfs. And his parents could just basically, they were the second class. Of among the serfs, so they don't have any properties. They live a horrible life. But because of the uh, the founding of New China, they ended this serfdom. And of course, the nobles and the privileged religious privileged classes they're gonna, they're gonna lose all the lands, all the properties. They were not happy. 
So they were really the ones that got pissed at the prosperity of Tibet now. But look at Tibet, like the descendants of this uh, Sir family, he's got a stable job, has a much better life, and so many more Serbs can have a much better life. They got a chance, they were no longer being considered as an animal live with love sauce. They got the ch chance to have, to, to earn money with their own hands and forever change their lives. So that's what I saw in Tibet. This descendant of a Serb family, he told me, I believe I have the video. And also it's also, um, it's on Daniel Dumbrell's vlogs. So I can, you can also download the vlogs, how he, uh, led us to a tour in, inside this uh, fancy villa owned by one of these noble families in Tibet and what he said. So this, this not, that is not, a, I'm inventing some stories. This is like a real story is happening uh, here. And also I think the biggest changes to ethnic groups, all ethnicities leaving China is ending poverty, of course. Most people know like at the end of 2020, poverty was, extreme poverty was eliminated in China. And I think um, people being affected most probably are the ethnic minorities living in like Northwest, Southwest, because those regions were remote mountainous areas. So a lot of ethnic groups, they used to live in remote mountains, um, like were just basically they were not interacting with the outside world for decades. But so that's why they were poor. And because there were no roads, they cannot get out of the mountain. But the biggest change, of course, is ending the poverty. They can get out of their mountains, move to a better house and uh, have a much more like a stable job, earning much more money. So a better life for everyone, I think is the biggest change to all ethnic groups. Now, I believe you've traveled throughout China, including Xinjiang, where you are now, and Tibet. What are your observations about the lives of minorities and their treatment by the government? Uh, as you've explained, the constitution gives, gives everyone impressive legal rights, but to what extent is that reflected in everyday life? Um, to give an example from the West, um, mm -hmm. we have different groups, different religions, different um, ethnicities and racial minorities, have a formal legal and constitutional equality, but actually in reality, if you look, especially at the United States, there is significant racial discrimination and religious discrimination. So, um, you know, the race that you're born into and the religion that you practice will affect your experience of everyday life. To what extent is that true in China? To what, to what extent do the minorities uh, enjoy sort of actual everyday equality? I think the situation in like about all the ethnic groups in China are very different from what it's like in the UK or in America. There's a real solidarity among all ethnic groups in China. Like I'm in Xinjiang now, I'm gonna use Xinjiang as an example because um, like Xinjiang is really diverse region. Uh, and I know it's called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. But as I mentioned earlier, there were 56 ethnic groups in China and 56 ethnic groups, people from 56 ethnic groups are living in Xinjiang. So it's a really diverse region. And of course, among those people, I think because of the narratives on Western media, Western politicians, they're probably gonna think we, uh, like Xinjiang is just a Muslim region. Uh, everybody believes in like uh, Islam. Of course, there's some uh, like a uh, big percentage of population believing Muslim, I probably half, half of Muslims here. Um, but um, there are all, all, there were also other ethnic groups believing in Buddhism, believe in like, they are Catholic, they are Christian, and they have their rights to do whatever they want. Uh, regarding, religious freedom specifically. If I'm, for example, Christian, or if I'm Muslim, or I'm Jewish, or I'm Buddhist, can I worship in the way that I want to? Can I attend a mosque, a church, a temple? Can I wear 
kind of traditional religious clothing? Can I follow the dietary rules of my religion, etc.? Is is that um? Can I do that freely without anyone trying to stop me? So there are like five major religions here in China. So there are Christians. Uh, there are people believing. There are Catholics and Taoism, Buddhism. Uh, Muslims, um, but I would say Buddhism probably is the biggest religion in China, and also there are like uh, uh, several different ethnic groups believing Isla they are Islamic. For example, like Uyghurs, Hui, and uh, Tajik in Xinjiang, uh, there are like ten ethnic groups believing like Islam. So of course, uh, there are, it's also protected by law. That people have their religious freedom, they can believe whatever uh, the religion they want to believe in. So there are, if you take a look, not just in Xinjiang, take a look in Beijing or those cities. There are churches, Catholic churches, Christian churches. There are mosques uh, everywhere. Um, in Xinjiang, the numbers of mosques grow like ten times in the past forty years. Ten times. So like people, like Muslims have more um, mosques probably than a lot of Islamic countries here in Xinjiang. So there were also so many mosques in Beijing in other big cities. So they can just go to those uh, temples or mosques or churches whenever they want. And for example, in Beijing, there are also churches for uh, like expats. So you can go to those regions, but maybe not this year, like uh, uh, in 2020, because of uh, COVID-19 restrictions, they, uh, all the temples and um, mosques and churches were closed to avoid mass gathering. I remember one of the reporters who went to the most famous mosque in Kashgar and uh, took a photo of the empty square, empty mosque of that, of that mosque and compared to with a photo that she took several years ago, because several years ago when she went there, there were so many people uh, going to the church to, to have their festivals. And she said something, I'm so sad to see the big changes. Uh, when I came here in 2009, there were so many people or something. But I was like, dude, you know there's a pandemic, right? There's the outbreak. That's all the temples, all the churches, all the mosques were shut down. That's why nobody were going to the mosques especially at that time in last September, Xinjiang just controlled their outbreak, one major outbreak. That's why there are no people go to the mosque. But, and also just uh, last month, I talked to the, uh, the uh, director, the pre vice president of China Islamic Association. He also told me, of course, like he is a Muslim, like he's born as a, as a Muslim. And he's being, he went to study Muslim in Egypt when he when he was young and came back for Islamic affairs for his life for decades in China now so of course everybody can um, believe in the re religion they want to believe in but all the mosques that you're being closed now just because of COVID nineteen so as long as the COVID nineteen is totally gone all the churches all temples and mosques will be open very soon again yeah I'm I'm in London in England as you know. And if I do an internet search right now for, mm. for mosques in China, then the only results I'll see are about the kind of forcible destruction of mosques all over China, and especially in, in, uh, in Xinjiang. But I've been to Xinjiang and also to Xi'an just over a year ago, mm -hmm. and I saw lots of mosques, very busy. Um, you know, they seem to be thriving. And the statistics are clear, as you've said, the number of mosques in Xinjiang has increased massively over the course of the last 40 years. So why is it if I'm looking at the Western media in Britain, in Australia, in the US, in Canada, um, I'll only find reports about destruction of mosques, nothing about construction of mosques. <laughs> Ask those reporters why they are not reporting the construction of the new mosque, why they are not reporting the mosques in Xinjiang grow 10 times, 10 times in the past 40 years. It, that number of mosques in Xinjiang is like a lot more than some Islamic countries. So here are the mosques, in, in, uh, also from the vice president of China Islamic Association, 
he said, well, like bosses in China are in different styles. So they go to different regions and try to um, combine the cultural elements from that region. So in Beijing, there are some mosques were just blended in with uh, other buildings. You don't see the difference. And in Xinjiang, it's the same. They have so many different styles. Some use the style from Arabic countries. Some use the cultures of from Shanxi, where like Hui Muslims are living there. So they're combining the styles and uh, cultures from different regions, but they are there, there are a lot. And also they keep saying Muslims are being like wiped out or in China. But um, I, I searched one month ago, China Islamic Institute where the Muslims in China want to pursue a higher degree, educational degree, uh, undergraduate or, uh, or postgraduate degree. Um, they, can, they, they will go to this China Islamic Institute. And despite having uh, to cope with COVID-19 in 2020, China Islamic Institute still finished uh, enrolling new students in probably November. I will check the news later soon because I saw the how they organized the exams uh, with all this COVID-19 restrictions, how to avoid infections. They enrolled new students. This China Islamic Institute, Institute is in Beijing and they have another compound in Xinjiang, China Islamic Institute in Xinjiang. They have eight different campuses across Xinjiang. And just two years ago, they built a big, bigger, newer, fancy compound in Xinjiang as well. So why then like the, some media uh, in, the, in the UK, in, the, in America, why they are not mentioning the construction of China Islamic Institute? Why they are not mentioning this fancy institute being built? Why they are not mentioning the mosques are growing 10 times in China? Very good question. So Western governments led by the US are starting now to impose boycotts on products made in Xinjiang or where Xinjiang is part of a global value chain. And there's an increasing media focus on the treatment of the Uyghur people. Some people in the West are even calling for a boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics because of supposed human rights abuses. Many British politicians say that a genocide is happening in Xinjiang. They claim that mosques are being demolished, that Muslims are being forced into concentration camps, that Uyghur women are being sterilized, that Uyghur culture is being wiped out, and so on. What's your response to some of these stories that one sees actually every day in the Western media these days? Is it a very different picture from what you've seen and what you're seeing now in Xinjiang? Of course, it's very different because they're telling all right lies. Genocide? Genocide, seriously? I just got the latest data from the government in Xinjiang, actually. So from the 2010 to 2018, this increase of Uyghur population grew 25%, 25%. And that, uh, that growing speed is much faster than other ethnic minorities living in Xinjiang and much more than Han people living in Xinjiang as well. So like Uyghur population living in Xinjiang is growing tremendously in just eight years from 2010 to 2018. What genocide boosts the population? That's a pretty bad genocide, right? And of course, like sterilization of women. You can see a lot of women here have two or three more kids. And uh, I believe uh, just uh, several days ago, I read um, a story of a uh, hundred year old Uyghur lady. Um, she's one of the long, long like, longest living uh, women. And uh, she had like over a hundred people in her whole family. So what can I say? They're creating those uh, out of nowhere all, all right lies. So what, do, what, what, what else did you mention? <laughs> I'm like, I have all this rage in me. I kind of like lost, lost my words. <laughs> so I suppose the, the biggest story around, around Xinjiang in the Western media 
is about these concentration camps. They say there are, some people say there are millions, some people say there are two million Uyghur Muslims who've been forced into these prisons to kind of indoctrinate them and to persuade them to adopt majority Han culture and to drop their, their Muslim traditions. Well, those people who are saying there are concentration camps, have they ever got the actual footage from those so-called concentration camps? No, they keep saying that, but the only, the only thing they have is satellite images um, and some pictures they draw uh, uh, with uh, some like descriptions from so-called uh, refu refugees. So they've been spreading this narrative for so long, but so far they cannot pr provide any single solid proof. And uh, they, of, of course, they use GPS, they use satellite images. And it seems like anything, any institution, any buildings with a wall, with a fence, looks like a concentration camps to them. And a lot of, love, a lot of those buildings prove to be just random government buildings. So in terms of this uh, vocational education training center, some people, some think tanks, some Western politicians, they call them concentration camps. And uh, just a few days ago, I talked to uh, several graduates who study at those vocational training centers. Um, and uh, two of them, two of them that I talked to are women. So I asked them what it's like to study there. Were you, were you for forced labor um, and were you like sterilized? Uh, were you facing any sexual assault? And those women were, were so furious. Um, I've also published the video on my Twitter. You can find the link. One of the women during the press conference, she's just so pissed at the BBC's recent report of this uh, systematic rape towards weaker women because um, she, that's just, did it, just didn't happen at all. But it, that's a huge insult to all the Uyghur women living in Xinjiang. This huge insult to all the female students who went to those vocational training centers. And uh, also I asked them like, what's, what is it like to study a living center? Do you have any freedom? They was like, of course, like we have freedom. We can leave when we want. It's just basically six classes every day. And after the classes, they can go home. And if they, uh, they have to leave, they, there's something emergency happening at home, they can ask for, ask for leave to go home. And during the weekends, of course, they can go home as well. And uh, I asked them, what do, you, what do you study at, the cen at this center? And one important thing is the, a, a vocational skill. They can choose any skill they want to learn. Uh, one lady, she told me she's really interested in computers. So that's why she cho chose these computers. There were so many other uh, what people who choose different uh, professional skills. So after they graduated from those schools, they can make a living by doing something. So during the press front conference, I met a lot of uh, graduates. Some of them own their own restaurants. Uh, some of them run their own companies for construction. Uh, for tourism, uh, some are just farmers, but they are better at uh, raising livestock now. They have uh, like big farmland because they used to, they, they thought, well, raising like livestock, you don't need too much knowledge. But after learning from this vocational training skill, they know how to scientifically uh, like raise those livestock, how to make them live longer, how to, like make a company from this business. So all of them have a stable job. And those two women I talked to, they work for the village women affairs uh, village uh, committee. So they are the women leaders protecting the women living in that village. So, and they were representing all the female students at the vocational training center. And they said, well, all of us female students are very, pissed at this BBC's report because basically they, they had a very happy experience living there. Um, they learned a skill to make a life of and they learned the national language because before they 
didn't really speak good national language. So they have less chance to have better, edu like higher education, like they'll go to college. So they learn mm, the national language so they can go everywhere to make a business everywhere. And uh, they meet friends, um, some of them are longtime friends now, and now they have a job. So a lot of them have very like, good experience from those vocational training center. And they told me it's not a concentration camps. So if those people who are actually graduates, who actually lived in those centers, they told me they did have freedom. They learned something. They are much better off with that experience. So where the accusations from the Western politicians coming from? Right. So it sounds like the centers are more connected with the poverty alleviation program than with some kind of sort of sinister program of cultural genocide. Uh, yes. And also it's a way to de-radicalize. Uh, that's the word. Am I pronouncing right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, one of the one of the job for some people, like for some people, those centers is also about eliminating or eradicating uh, extremism. Like those two women that I talked to, the reason they one of the, of course they want to learn a professional skill at those center, um, but uh, one of the reason they went to those center is they were influenced by this uh, religious extremism. So um, one lady told me that uh, many years ago, uh, some, some of her, her friends were keep telling her with this uh, extremism thoughts. So during some time, she believes uh, women should not go out, women should not work, money made by women are uh, haram, not Muslim, it's like sin. So, uh, and that's the thing. So, and for guys, there were some guys also sharing the experience, how were they infected by, uh, how were they infected by this uh, religious extremism. Some of the guys believed to participate in jihad and uh, murdering people. And once they go to heaven, they will have 72 wives. They were sharing this experience um, to like a lot of people but uh, go to those centers and even their family members will worry about them because they believe anyone who are not Muslims are infidels. So they are not interacting with any infidels and they are like telling their families, their relatives not to interact with any infidels. So their families were very worried about them. So like there, some of them were like kind of uh, recommended by their family members to maybe like you can go to those uh, uh, vocational training centers um, so you can learn some skill to have a job so to also learn the language so you have more opportunities. So one thing I noticed in Urumqi last year and I think one thing any traveler will notice in Xinjiang having been previously in Beijing or Shanghai or Guangzhou or Chongqing or wherever is that there's a very high level of security compared to other, uh, other parts of China. You walk through metal detectors multiple times a day, you have your bag checked multiple times a day. What's the reason behind this? Is it you know, part of a, a program of trying to oppress Uyghur Muslims or is there some other reason? <laughs> okay, uh, of course there's a heavy security, but it's not about oppressing Uyghurs. I'm a Han Chinese and I have to go through all the same procedures. Uh, as well when I come here. Um, maybe now is, I remember I came here in 2016 and uh, the sec security level was like even higher back then. And I went through so many security checks everywhere I go, any tiny restaurant I go, any shopping malls I go. It like it even got me pissed at some extent why are you checking me so many times? But I have to like uh, uh, tell myself they are doing this for a reason. So just, just calm down, it's for your safety. So uh, as a Han Chinese, uh, like uh, I traveled from Beijing to Urumqi back then, I have to go through the same security checks. So there's no difference. It's not just targeting Uyghurs, it's targeting <laughs> it's everyone, it's for everyone, either you're Chinese or foreigners or different, uh, like Chinese from different ethnic backgrounds. But the reason behind that was Xinjiang is a very pretty place, but 
it suffered from terrorist attacks for a really long time. So I think um, the, the roughly the estimated uh, from, 1990, from 1990 to 2016, there were over there were thousands of thousands of terrorist attacks across Xinjiang, small and big, like thousands of terrorist attacks. And you cannot count how many people died. I mean, just people back then couldn't live a peace and stable life. There were some major terrorist attacks probably many people in the outside of China know of. Uh, one is, I think it's 20, 2009, July the 5th, 2009. There were this uh, major um, terrorist attacks in Urumqi. So the terrorists were um, setting buses, cars on the street on fire, uh, like uh, destroying shops, destroying police cars. About 197 people died, and uh, 1,700, more than 1,700, were injured. That's one of the major terrorist attacks in 2009. And uh, it's not it's not just targeting Han Chinese. People think it's about it's a racial war, but it's really just terrorists using nationalism as a guise. They are uh, murdering everyone. There's another incident in Kashgar in 2014. They uh, killed this uh, religious leader, a Uyghur religious leader of the mosque, right in front of the mosque. So you think it's really about religious freedom? They are killing religious leader, Uyghur religious leader as well. And uh, the terrorist attacks were not just in Xinjiang, the terrorists expanded to other regions of China. For example, also in 2014, uh, there's some major attacks in Kunming railway station. Just uh, at, at, at that night, from out of nowhere, a bunch of terrorists um, took out their huge knives and started to slaughter everyone they saw. Everyone, no matter it's men, women, or children. So they were all led by terrorists at a terrorist group called uh, East Turkestan Islamic Movement, ETRM. So it's because of Xinjiang suffered from terrorist attacks for a really long time. That's why they need this heavy security to make sure terrorists won't made it to Xinjiang, made it to those regions um, because people couldn't leave, like they couldn't, they cannot get up, get out of power, they cannot have a prosperous life if there are like terrorist attacks every day. So the circuit check was really meant for like terrorists. And uh, luckily the measures were very effective. The counter-terrorism measures were very effective because I think it has been more than four years. Xinjiang hasn't seen any terror, terrorist attacks in the past four years. That's why the job of poverty alleviation can be successfully finished in Xinjiang by the end of 2020. That's why people in Xinjiang have a better life now. So that's about the security checks. And would you say that the population, the people in Xinjiang accept the high level of security on the basis that it's being effective in preventing terrorist attacks? Mm, accepting, um, I'm sure a lot of people, maybe some people were not entirely happy about it, but that's the thing like need to be done. Like even me, I'm not a terrorist, but if I have to go through that many uh, <laughs> like the security checks, I got pissed as well. So I'm sure other people like me, they gonna be annoyed with this heavy security, but we kind of accept it because it needs to be done. It's for our safety. It's annoying, but it's just annoying. At least we won't die <laughs> from the terrorists. We won't get a see a set of, like a huge knife uh, like um, like cutting my throat. So that's the thing needs to be done. And I can walk freely without worrying anything in the street of Xinjiang, just like everybody else. I remember, I think, um, what was the year? It was uh, 2006, just two years after this uh, major uh, terrorist attacks. Um, there were so many 
like the bazaar, this bazaar in Sita Sinar Purumachi, it was so empty because tourists were not coming, they were afraid. And uh, I went to the bazaar, all those uh, shop owners, they are Uyghurs, they are the just like normal citizens living in Urumqi. They were very upset. I talked to the, uh, one of the shop owners who is a Uyghur, um, I asked him, how do you feel? And it's like, it's, like, it's, very, it's, it's annoying. Because of those terrorist attacks, no people are coming to Xinjiang. So we have no business. So they are like the citizens are very annoyed by this um, terrorist attacks. So I think there are most people are just accepting, accepting the fact. And of course now they are very happy because life are very like stable and peaceful right now. Yeah. Thank you. So you mentioned the East Turkestan independence movement. Is that right? Um, and uh, a East Turkestan Islamic movement. Islamic movement, okay. Yeah, I am. Um, but it, this is a movement that calls for um, for independence for Xinjiang and for the establishment of a of a Uyghur Muslim majority state in Xinjiang. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Um, and and the there's actually a significant level of support for that position in the West that, um, that China is a colonial power in Xinjiang, it's a colonial power in Tibet, it's a colonial power in Hong Kong. I think especially with Tibet, you know, a lot of people in the West have been exposed to the idea of Tibetan independence for a lot of, for, you know, for many decades because Western governments have tended to support that cause. You've been to Tibet, would you say that there's kind of a a thriving, a, a popular independence movement there? Do, do the Tibetan people want to have their own state and be free from, from colonial China? And, and also, what does the rest of China think about the idea of Tibetan independence? Oh, well, I was in Tibet. I didn't see any people have the idea like, oh, let's have a, like, let's be independent. On the contrary, they are very happy about with it, what the life they have now because it's very peaceful as much as more stable and they got wealthier. Even for the herdsmen, I remember I visited one of the family of herdsmen, um, which part? In north of Tibet. And I asked her, like this woman couldn't speak Mandarin. Uh, she speaks this um, kind of a, a dialect of Tibetan. So we communicated with through this translator. And she said, She's around 50 years old. And just uh, during her life, she witnessed the dramatic change. Even she's uh, like a herd, herdsman living in the middle of the mountains. She says, well, when she was young, um, there were no electricity, no drinking water. Because they were herdsmen, they have to change the grassland from time to time. So it's normally just this huge grassland, just one family living in the middle. So it's, it's reasonable, it's just one household, there's no electricity or drinking water. But even to those um, individual family, herdsman family, the government already made it possible to, they have a, a grid, they have a well to have a drinking water. They have electricity of this uh, tiny houses in the middle of the grassland. And uh, living in those grassland, to me, I'm just curious, how do you get your necessities? And uh, how, what, what if you need to go to see doctors? And she said when she was young, um, she has to, like if she wants to buy something, she has to go to the, like the county riding a horse, which will take two or three days to arrive. Uh, but now just take a motorcycle, half an hour, it'll be there. So it's very convenient. So about the doctors, um, they can go to the, it's, it's just small diseases. They can just go to the county to go to the hospital. But if it's emer emergency, they can call the county and doctors will go to this grassland, find this husband's family to help them. That's just small changes in her life during the like past of 40 or 50 years. So they are, what I saw is they are really happy with their life now. Most people, and here, like, maybe it's just me, but I really don't feel this uh, racial war among the different ethnic groups living in China. We have a saying here, it's like all ethnic groups should 
uh, hold on to each other like a pomegranate seeds. So when we have this solidarity, we can be stronger together. So that's the idea of all the ethnic groups in China. And by the way, if they keep saying genocide, colonial rule of China's, China's role. I mean, if they really want to know what is genocide and the colonial power, they probably should ask indigenous people in North America, in Australia. That is the real genocide. And uh, British, that is the real colonial power around the world. So, well, I have a feeling everything they accusing China has been doing was exactly the thing they did in the past. So it's like they're projecting what they see the what they see the world and what they've been doing to China, which is just completely a different case. It's not happening in China, but that's exactly what they did. And on a connected note, what would you say if I told you that some British politicians, including some British politicians who consider themselves to be progressive or on the left, have recently signed statements applauding the anniversary of colonial rule in Hong Kong. Would you like to send any message to them? Well, the angry Jing Jing will say, F colonizers, haven't you done enough damage to the world with your colonialism? So how dare you to celebrate the colonial rule, the anniversary of colonial rule, how dare you? But the calm Jing Jing probably will say, um, no, <laughs> I got nothing good to say. Um, so the last question I wanted to ask you was, you know, in many Western countries, and I believe you studied in Britain, is that right? Yeah. Um, there's some idea of affirmative action or, or sometimes called positive discrimination, whereby oppressed minorities, racial or religious minorities are given some preferential treatment in certain areas, for example, in education or employment, as a means of trying to, to make up for past inequalities or racist treatment, systematic racist treatment. Does China have any kind of policies like that? There are so many, like, um, how to say, the policies to give more chances for uh, ethnic minorities. Um, I can separate them in education, uh, family planning, and maybe like uh, for uh, finding a job. Um, okay, maybe let's start with education. So of course, um, so because of, oh, okay. Maybe I would say the, how much, like the percentage of different ethnic groups. So like in China, there were 56 different ethnic groups, but the Han people is the majority. Um, and uh, the all the, so Han is not, a minority uh, ethnic groups, we call the 55 uh, ethnic minority groups. And the 55 ethnic groups accounted for about 8.4% of all the populations in China. So because of that, the minorities, um, there were so many policies to uh, give more chances for people of different, uh, of all the minority groups. Uh, for example, in terms of education, um, the college entrance exam is one of the like hardest exams in China. It's life changing exams. All the Chinese students have been have experienced. Um, it's very difficult to get a higher score to enter a college. But if you are ethnic minority, you get some extra points. And based on the region you are from, the ethnic groups you are from, you're from, and the population of your ethnic groups. So the, the points varies, but uh, some uh, like people can add up, up to 20 scores, 20 points to, this to these exams. 20 points can make a lot of difference. So that's the education give more opportunities to the people of at the, at the minority groups. And also there are, um, in this law of this uh, law on regional autonomy, they also specifically listed for institutions in autonomous regions, for companies 
either like it's government uh, government institutions or just uh, other companies, uh, they should uh, consider to hire more, give like ethnic minorities more chances. So they like it's mandatory for them to hire people of ethnic minorities, and they are encouraging they are hire more to give more opportunities to ethnic minorities. So they are providing more jobs for uh, ethnic minorities. And also in terms of family planning, that's why those some people keep saying uh, Uyghur women are being sterilized is just hilarious because they have no idea about China's policy. Um, I know China's one child policy has long been disputed. Um, many people don't agree with it, but uh, the one child, child, one child policy exists in China for so long, it only applied to Han Chinese. So when the rule was still here, if you're ethnic minorities, you can have more kids. You can, and it's still the same. So now there's no longer one child policy. It's like Arab, other families can have like two kids. But uh, if you're ethnic minorities, it, ethnic minorities, especially if you live in countryside, if you're not from the city in autonomous regions, you can have three kids. And for uh, some groups with a very small population, they can have more. Under certain circumstances, they can have more kids. So they are giving more chances. They are giving the chances for ethnic minorities to have more kids. So these are all the some all those um, like rules to give better chance for ethnic minorities, and. And there's still a lot more, but I will find out and send you, keep you updated. That's great. Thank you, Jingjing. Jing. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for giving us a very different picture of what happens with Chinese ethnic minorities to, to what we hear about in the media. It's so important to, to counter this narrative of slander, which ultimately is being used to build public support for a new Cold War for an escalation against China, which actually is very dangerous um, and that we should be doing everything we can to avoid because it doesn't help the people of China, it doesn't help the people of the West either. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your experiences and please be reassured that there are people in Britain and in the West that don't support the new Cold War, that don't support, for example, um, Ofcom's decision to revoke CGTN's broadcast license. Um, we stand for <laughs> for peace and for friendship and for understanding between our countries and China. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Because uh, I know a lot of Chinese, when they see the, some reports from The Guardian, from the BBC, they have this negative view on the whole Britain, to be honest. Like, I have a lot of love for Britain. Like, I used to live and study there. I really like the culture, the the, like everything, it's just I enjoy different cultures, different countries. But um, yeah, like even though I have so much love for Britain, this recent <laughs> narratives they've been pushing, the attitudes they towards China just really piss me off, and I'm very disappointed to some some level in terms of the Hong Kong issues, uh, in terms of in terms of this uh, Xinjiang issues. And I also recommend you to watch a funny video that I shared. Some Chinese citizens created this funny video, like uh, <laughs> satire, how to be a BBC, a good BBC journalist. <laughs> it's funny. Um, so just, yeah, it's good to know that there are people in Britain, in America, uh, like you, are seeing China without a lens of prejudice. Thank you.